least. I think the next labs we have set up is so uh, we did level control. Right? Yeah, I've been playing around. I need to get this out and show y'all that in a while. I hooked up a quadrature encoder to my PLC. And then, uh, so level sensors. Anybody got any questions on level sensors? So we looked at the difference uh, between distance and level, right? Everybody okay on those definitions? I don't know if I put that in the glossary or not. I need to make sure that's in there. So distance is usually the space between two points, right? Two things. And the level is usually from a, from a reference. And so we looked at uh, ultrasonic sensors. We looked at the photoelectric sensors, time of flight. We looked at uh, the straight level sensors. We looked at uh, and that was it. We're okay. Of course, what we're using is we're using uh, read switches, which would be similar to this one, but not exactly the same. So, what we have in our in our sensing elements is we have a magnet, a permanent magnet. And we have a lead switch that's part of the magnet where the magnet is right between the positions. I think we got one uh, that's set up to be normally closed, and we got one that's set up to be normally open, which you mount it with the, which you mount it with the name up. And of course, you can change them around by changing the way we mount the, the module. So the next thing we'll look at is temperature sensors. So this is something that we really, really need to monitor. We have temperature sensors. Where do you have temperature sensors at your house? You have thermostat? Oven? Probably your refrigerator's got a temperature sensor in there, especially if you got the ability. Like mine, I can open it up and I can set the temperature that I want it to be, right? Our water heater. Our water heater's probably got temperature sensors in it. Uh, probably if you got a clothes dryer, it's got temperature sensors in it, right? So we got even in our house, we got several temperature sensors in our house. A device capable. Uh, so we've already looked at this. You, this is on every slide that I put. What a what a sensor is. And even in my PLC class yesterday, I asked the same question. So these are what we sent so far. So we're, we're we're on temperature. So we're we're doing a lot of things here. So we're out of here on temperature. Uh, so we're going to look at what we call bimetallic strips, thermocouples, RDTs, thermistors, infrared, and then integrated temperature sensors. I mean, we got some of these. I don't think we need to bring those over. That's pretty neat. Are we okay? So these are some things we need to understand the different scales of temperature that we measure. Uh, centigrade is an SI or international standard rule of measuring temperature. As far as I know, guys, uh, there's only two countries in the world that still use what we refer to as U.S. customs. And that's, of course, the U.S. And then I, I, Liberia or something like that. It's only so everybody else in the world has gone over to what we call SI units or international standard units. So what does that mean? That means we need, if we're going to work in an environment that we're we're around here, uh, you know, because 
in our in our vicinity we have uh, we dominate two countries uh, here. We have German a lot of German companies here now, right? You understand? We've got some Japanese uh, here too, uh, and then we got uh, we got U.S. companies here. So we 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 are in a situation where we need to learn the two different ways of measuring things. So centigrade, uh, this is centigrade, which makes sense. Centigrade makes sense because in centigrade, on the centigrade scale or the Celsius scale, uh, I believe it's called, uh, it used to be called centigrade. I need to change that. I believe the preferred scale now we call it Celsius. So I need to change that. Uh, zero degrees is freezing and 100 degrees is boiling. Now so you got 100 marks between zero and 100. Zero thirty-two degrees on, on the Fahrenheit, yeah. Well, they think zero up there. But th we're not on the Fahrenheit scale. We're on the centigrade scale. The first scale is the centigrade scale or the Celsius scale. On the centigrade scale, zero is freezing and a hundred degrees is boiling. And this is water at sea level. I should I should put that too because you know water boils at different temperatures depending on what sea level. Uh, well, what I'm wondering is what. Below freezing, uh, minus, 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 minus just like minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. But the scales are exactly the same thing. Uh, so they have ten scale, they have ten marks between degrees normally, right? You understand? And those same ten marks, so every one of those marks would be worth a tenth of a degree, right? You understand? Uh, we have a lot between the centigrade scale. I forgot how many on the Fahrenheit. So the Fahrenheit scale, scale, this is U.S. customary, so we knew we can do it. And this is what's so strange. We have 32 degrees here, in this one, which is a lot. Freezing, we have 212 as well. So before we get into minus degrees on the Fahrenheit scale, we got to, it's got to be zero, which would be uh, basically, right, you understand that. It's really a really strange scale. Everybody okay? <laughs> huh? It's a strange scale. Uh, Fahrenheit's no, and, I'm and talking about absolute zero. Below temperatures do not exist. What's wrong with that? Because there, we've never met that. It's just like infinity. So if I say infinity, you'd say above that number don't exist. So if I if I ever hit affinity, there's nothing above that, right? Y'all understand that? So when we say once we hit infinity, so yeah. basically there there's no temperature below absolute zero. That's absolute. That's absolute. <laughs> that's absolute zero. No, we can't measure. We, absolute zero has never been measured. It's just like infinity's never been. Measured. We can get down really, really cold, but nobody's got down to absolute zero. Absolute zero has been calculated. And what they've done is they've looked at how much the speed of molecules change with temperature, and they've, they've calculated where it what, where it stops. That's all. So absolute zero has been calculated. Infinity hadn't been calculated. We just don't have enough people. So everybody okay on those scales? It's uh, minus, a, so absolute zero on the Kelvin scale is zero. Absolute zero on the Rankin scale is zero. Well, that's what it would measure. It would measure zero. Anything above absolute zero would be considered a plus temperature. Now, what we've given or what you look up, if, if, if I was going to measure the Celsius scale, <laughs> if we could ever get down to minus 270 degrees centigrade, then that would be absolute that would measure absolute that would measure zero on the Kelvin scale. On the Fahrenheit scale, if I've got down to 549.67 degrees Fahrenheit, that would measure zero on the Rankin scale. So the Rankin scale is absolute zero relative to US customary, right? And the Kelvin scale is absolute zero relative to the Celsius scale. Everybody understand that? Of course, more and more in these companies, you're going to see a lot of times what they try to do over here. I don't know if y'all remember, but for a while, they tried to move us over to the, uh, 
the international standard, the metric system for speeds and measurements. Y'all remember that? Anybody was around there? What did they do? <laughs> they came up on the interstate, and all all the signs would give would give distances in miles, and they would give it in kilometers. And then every, then they had these uh, popsicles, these mile markers. They had mile markers and they had kilometer markers. And so they were interspaced with each other. And what they're, and if you, if you bought a car during that time, so if you go back and look at a car during that time, it had both scales on there. It had miles per hour and it had kilometers per hour on the same scale. And, but what happened? You, the United States, we're set in our ways, right? So instead of, I imagine, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, about 85. yeah, so that's about when they were trying to convert us over, and what did they end up doing? They, they ended up what? Getting rid of the, uh, all the metric stuff and going back to the U.S. customer. So we're, we're, so what we're going to find out in, in a lot of our companies is your gauges are going to have two scales on them. What's so, What's that? I don't know. Well, the street signs are in Spanish. I thought it was in both. I thought they had them in both languages down there. They yeah, are. They both. I think in uh, Canada, certain certain uh, of the uh, in Canada, they have the French and English. Some some of them are totally in French. From what I understand. Huh? They were born in Michigan. So you're going to see a lot of temperature gauges over here that's going to have both a Celsius scale and a Fahrenheit scale. Now the problem is, is the number of uh, of marks between uh, the number of degrees between uh, 32 and 212. What's that? And that's what we come up and get. So for every five marks on the Fahrenheit, I mean on, on the Celsius scale, we have nine on the Fahrenheit. Is that right? Five nine, max nine four. So that's where we get the conversion factor. So how do you convert from uh, centigrade to Fahrenheit? Yeah, here you use nine fifths. So you'd go from centigrade uh, to Fahrenheit. You go uh, centigrade times what? Nine fifths plus thirty two. And if I was going from the Fahrenheit to the centigrade scale, I would do Fahrenheit. I do centigrade would be equal to five ninths, right? Times Fahrenheit uh, minus thirty two. Everybody okay? So your temperature sensors, except for these, uh, these guys, uh, uh, these guys, you either get them to give you an output, or these guys give you an output, or both of the outputs represent temperature. So you've got one of them that's calibrated for the Fahrenheit scale, and you've got one that's calibrated for the centigrade. All these other ones have, they don't make, they, they're not calibrated basically for anything. Right, in the same amount of thing. So a bimetallic strip measures temperature. It's going to do what it does when it senses a certain amount of heat, right? Is that centigrade heat or is it Fahrenheit heat? It don't matter. So what we do with bimetallic strips, uh, we know that metals expand. So metals expand with what? Yeah, they expand with heat, and then they retract when they when they move toward this. So when they move toward this, they so and then uh, we have what we call the coefficient expansion. Metals expand and contract at different different temperatures at different rates depending on what type of metal they are. So aluminum has a high coefficient of expansion. So we got to be real careful with aluminum 
uh, when we do aluminum wire, we got to make sure we tighten everything down really well, right? Understand because it, it expands and contracts so much uh, that it could actually work itself loose. Now, copper doesn't expand as much. So copper's got a lower coefficient of expansion. But aluminum's got a high coefficient of expansion. Right? You understand that? Uh, one of the classes I took in, in uh, physics, we took a piece of metal and we put it up. In a steam chamber, and then uh, we would measure how much we use with a micrometer to measure where it was at when we did put steam in there, and then we would use it to measure. Then we could see it actually do what uh, expand when we heated that thing up, and then we would calculate the coefficient of expansion. And we had all these different rods. We have brass rods, steel rods, and we, we actually did that in our physics class. So if I take these two metals and bond them together, uh, then what are they going to do? And then I expose these to heat. So we got two metals, they're bonded together. And then we two, we use metals that have different coefficients of expansion. So this might be one metal. And then the other one might be the other metal. So what's that strip going to do? Warp. It's going to warp, right? You understand? The one that and it, the one that uh, expands faster is going to make it actually warp in the direction of the one that expands slower. Okay. And the percentage that it warps would give us an indication of what? If we, the coefficient of temperature, but it would give us the it would give us the give us the uh, the amount that it warps would be relative to, proportional to the amount of temperature it's in, right? You understand that? So this is a good example. Two melted bonds together of different uh, coefficients of expansion. So we have a delta, by the way. Anytime you see delta, it means a change of. So delta T means we have a change in what? Temperature. So anytime you see that in any of your electrical formulas, that's what it means. So we come up here and we start bonding together and then we come up here and we start expanding it. Uh, the red one expands faster than the blue one, so that's the direction of the blue The amount it warps would give us what? Uh, the temperature. Very okay. It's going to warp toward the one that has the lower coefficient. So this guy don't expand as fast. This guy here expands real fast. So you can think about it when you're you're driving your car and you're and you you're make a left turn. Well, your inside wheel turns a lot slower. Your outside wheel turns a lot faster, and that's what it's going to do. So you turn in that direction, right? You understand? So this is the same principle. So this would be your slow wheel. This would be your fast wheel, and then it comes up here and you know, we call this the warp. And this is really really reliable because these coefficients of expansion, especially the, the, the pure the metals are. Uh, then the more precise the treasure is that you get. What are those used for? You don't get to that later. We use them all over the place. We use them in temperature switches. We use them in switches, temperature switches. Because these are metals, metals conduct current. So what I could literally do is, uh, is I could come up here and put a plus voltage over here and a minus voltage right there. And I could literally come over here and, and put this like this, right? You understand? I'd have to look at the symbol. Oh, I know what the symbol is. Okay. So that could be a bimetallic strip. And then, of course, when it's below its temperature, it would be closed. And when it gets up to a separate temperature, it would do what? It open. We call these temperature switches. These guys are all over the place. So you got one in your exhaust of your, in your, uh, in your, uh, you got one in the exhaust of your dryers. You got an electric dryer to cut off the power if it senses a. If the exhaust is too hot, what does that mean? First of all, it means one of two things. It means your clothes are dry. Well, that's one way they can sense when the clothes is dry because if it's if it's got moisture in the heat, it's it's going to cool it down, right? So they'll put this thing in the exhaust back there, and you say you can you can come up here and say I want my temperature my things to dry. And it'll run until what? Until that temp temperature switches, and now it knows your clothes are dry. Uh, we use them in circuit breakers. We use them in any, uh, just about all your thermal overloads or your thermal switches. 
are, are basically nothing but just bimetallic strips. We use them on temperature indicator gauges. Uh, basically what they'll do is they'll take a biometallic strip and they'll put it in a coil. Some breakers operate on it, some breakers don't. Some breakers, uh, we have what we call magnetic activated switches that, that depends on the magnetic field. And I'm going to show you all that we have we have biometallic circuit breakers where they put the current through the, through the biometallic strip. The biometallic strip is made out of a metal that has a little bit of resistance, right? You come over here and you put through you put I through R, you got I square R, it gets hot and it bends itself and opens up the circuit breaker. So we have biometallic strip circuit breakers. Uh, old thermostat old thermostats use biometallic strips. Most of your new thermostats don't do this, but your old thermostats you buy you got an old house, uh, I guarantee you we use the biometallic strip uh, as a system. Uh, the system. Well, uh, Thermostat. Had that coil in there? Yeah, they have a, that's a biometallic strip. And what they do is, we, uh, what we do is, we adjust the tension of the frame. So if I if I put more tension on this thing, so normally what you're doing is this guy's attached to something, and then when you set your thermostat, you turn it this way, and it puts more tension on the spring, which means it's going to take more temperature to cause it to warp, right? Understand that. Uh, we turn it this way and it would put less here. So this is the way your old thermostats work. And what I'm doing is I'm looking for one. We got one here. Uh, so this right here is a, this right here uses the biometallic strip. This is an old thermostat. So this is the biometallic strip right here. I need to get my camera out too so I can record it for the people who can't see it. So that's a biometallic strip right there. That's an older thermostat. Our new thermostats don't use biometallic. If you got a digital uh, thermostat, it doesn't use biometallic strip because that's mechanical, right? And uh, if you look on that, it's got a, um, it's got a, uh, it's got a, yeah, that's what it is. It's a, that's what it, this has got, so don't drop that, guys. That's got mercury in it. So what is mercury? Mercury is a metal that has an extremely low melting temperature. So at, at the temperatures that we see, uh, mercury is already melted. It's already a liquid. And what they can do is they can use that as a switch. So they'll put it inside a glass cylinder, and then they'll put electrodes in there. And when the, mo when the mercury moves, it may it, uh, close its contact. So this is basically what they're doing inside that thing, right? You understand? So what we do is we either anchor this, but on that thermostat, what you're doing is you're turning this. So if you put, if you, if you tighten down the spring, it's going to take more, more temperature to make it expand, right? And if you loosen it up, it's going to take less temperature. So we can set the temperature with that. You can have one of them old old carburetors on the side. You don't know where you are. Oh yeah, it was a. Uh, I don't know if they used sure. it as a biometallic strip. It might have been the choke. Yeah, it was. You're right. So what they did is a, it was an automatic choke. So what it did when your car was cold, the biometallic strip would have the choke closed, and then in the winter time or in the summertime, it would open up, open up because you didn't need uh, to choke it off. It. So this is what you're looking at there. So we have a biometallic sensor. And what we do is we set the temperature on one end and then the biometallic strip is uh, tries to uncoil or try to coil in. And what you did is uh, your mercury switch had one set of contacts on the inside, one set of contacts on the outside. And what you did is you, you switch between air conditioning and heat. And when you switch to one, it depends on which set it used, right? You understand? So one of them looked for it to coil up, which would be cold. One of them looked for it to uncoil, which would be the heat. Y'all remember the old thermostats, but they're passing that around. 
a bimetallic uh, with contacts, and we looked at that. The bimetallic strip, uh, bim uh, temperature switches are very common. Just about every temperature switch that I know of, these are switches where the bimetallic strip is looking for for it to exceed the temperature. As soon as it exceeds the temperature, it does what? It opens. We also can get them where the bimetallic strip closes when it gets to a certain temperature. So we have those also available. As you get inside a microwave, you get inside your oven, you get inside your uh, your uh, your heater. If you got a uh, if you got an external heating unit, they've probably got a switch out there that's in there as a safety, right? You understand? Where if it gets up to a certain temperature, uh, you know, if your firebox gets up to a certain temperature, it means you got a problem. It exceeds the range that it's supposed to be operating. Everybody okay? I'm a tag strip. Well, that's on both sides. So over here on the contact, uh, this would be one of our conductors. So what makes it contact? What makes it up? Well, temperature makes it contact. Where'd you get the signal for the temperature? It's just in the. Where does it get the temperature? Where do I get this? Where do I? I don't understand your question. Where do I get my sensors for temperature? Anywhere. All we have to do is just open it up to whatever we're going to do. Normally, these switches are going to have a these 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 uh these temperature switches. They're going to have a flat surface on them, and then they're going to come up here, and they're going to have two connections on them, and then they got screws out here where you literally come in and mount it onto what you want to sense. So if you look at the one that's in the oh, okay. exhaust for your dryer, it's it's flat and it's mounted against the exhaust for the dryer. Yeah, so it, it'll or, or we could we could expose it to this, right? Uh, so you know, it's on that thermostat. It's just opened up to room temperature. It's got if you if you ever look at your thermostat, whether it's digital or whether it's these or these, they've got whole slots all in them, right? So the temperatures, so the so the the surrounding temperature can get into the sensor. Understand? So this is the way a, circuit, a, a thermal, a biometallic thermal break uh, works. Uh, this is one of our contacts, right? This is one of our contacts. And what happens when this thing bends, it hits this little V. When it hits that little V, it snaps. Have you ever seen a circuit breaker? A cir we, when, we, when we open a circuit, most of the time when we open a circuit, we want it to be real fast, right? And why do we want to do that? Yeah, to eliminate, to, to, get, to extinguish the arc real fast. So just the motion of it moving real fast has a tendency to to, uh, to extinguish it, and plus, uh, uh, so this is the bimetallic circuit breaker. Y'all probably seen these. So here's the bimetallic strip right here. So this is one of our connections. It flows through this, and then this would be when it's closed. So the current actually has to flow through what the bimetallic strip. And then when it hits that plateau, when it starts bending, it does what? It snaps real fast. So we have two types. We have magnetic, which actually operates off the magnetic field, and then bimetallic strip circuit breaker. And I guess it depends on who the manufacturer is. Everybody okay so far? Any questions? We okay? So when you take the power off, it goes back to the uh... After it cools down. Now, so all these things, uh, the bimetallic strip has to cool down. So one problem you have with bimetallic strips, it's just like when a circuit breaker trips. If it's got a bimetallic strip in there, guys, you go over there and you try to, if you're in there when it trips, you cannot reset it because you have to give time for what? The strip to cool off. So if you've got any circuit breakers in your house and you're standing there when they trip and you try to reset it and it won't reset until you let it cool off, you know it's using a magnetic strip. If it's a magnetic circuit breaker, uh, then it, you can reset it instantly because it works on a magnetic field. It don't work on it. Uh, but, yeah, are, are, the, are, are what magnetic? Or the, yeah, you can reset. Yeah. Usually industry, usually industry, uh, usually industry is more prone to use the the magnetic uh, the magnetic circuit breakers, and then uh, residential is more prone to use the uh, use the strip. I think in the, it, I have seen them in the past because I do remember you could, and I thought, oh, I gotta go buy another. Yeah, but you just gotta wait till them cool down. Thermal couples. 
And I don't think I brought my phone with me. Uh, a lot of your leaders uh, now come with uh, come with girls. So what a thermal couple does, and that's the problem with having most of your stuff in another class trying to remember to bring it to And this is we'll we'll stop right here when we get through this and we'll start to work on some labs. So thermocouple. Uh, what they found out a long time ago is that when you start mixing this similar metal with strange things start happening. Like if you mix aluminum and copper with each other, they will literally eat each other up. And so if you ever mix aluminum and copper, uh, there's a paste that you buy that you put on it to prevent that oxidation from occurring. So two metals are joined at the end, producing a proportional many both EML, which what? When the junction is heated, and the types of metals determine the temperature range. Uh, it requires a reference junction, so we have to have a reference junction. So if I'm going to measure, if I'm going to get a voltage, it's just like when we use an increment encoder. Uh, what do we have to do if we're going to get a position on that thing? We have to always start it from the wall. From a reference point. So this guy is going to give us a voltage as proportional to temperature, but you got to have a reference for that temperature, right? And so, so if I measure 15 millivolts out of it, what does that mean? Unless it's reference to a certain level. So we got uh, two junctions. So a thermocouple, we always got to have two junctions. We have a hot junction and what they normally call a cold junction. So if you ever hear a cold junction, that's actually the law of the reference. Everybody okay? Now, why I got the number cold junction is they used to take originally, and when I took it, these things is we, we actually put the, this junction inside a glass of, of, of ice water. So that gave us a reference of what? Degrees centigrade or prior. I'm saying thermocouple is on my heat. Oh, you see thermocouple all over. But anytime, anytime you want extremely pre precise. Temperature measurements that that don't need a power source. The problem is we've got we've got other devices that give us give us really good temperature measurements, but they all have to be powered up. Thermocouples don't have to be powered up because why? I know you turn this off for a year or two and try to turn it back on. It's gonna come on. My nephew at the gas company put spiders to that thing in the thermocouple. A tiny, tiny spider. If you got a gas water heater, it uses a thermocouple oh. to open open the valve, really. So we can do this different ways. We can do it in what they call an ice bath, which is the way I work on it. <clears throat> or we can have an electronic bridge. So we compare it to this. We like to that. We can use thermoelectric refrigeration. All we got to do is try to maintain a precise temperature that we can reference the voltage of the thermocouple. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> this is the one that's used most often inside measurements. Are we okay? Oh, I need to give y'all reaction. I need to give y'all that handout. Now. <laughs> so this is basically the way a thermal couple works. We start off with two wires of different metals. Here they're using constant and time, right? I understand. And then we have a cold junction at a reference temperature. Or a reference, it don't have to be a reference temperature, it can be a reference voltage. I mean, we can, we can use a reference voltage to compare it to, right? You understand that? And one of the uh, things I use is use this little finger diagram. And what we do is we take this guy, the output of this guy, and if you notice, they're 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 wired opposed to each other. So the negative on my uh, hot probe, my hot junction, is hooked up to the negative on my cold junction. So what does that mean? The positive hooked up to the positive. So what does that mean? 
automatically they're going to subtract from each other, right? So it's a real complicated formula. <laughs> What y'all think the formula? So V out would be equal to what? V hot minus what? V cut. That makes sense? V out V H. Yeah, net. This would be net. I think you. So well, that's why they're they're hooked up a series of poses, right? So they're gonna do well with each other. So we that. So this is probably the most popular method of doing right here. We're coming in. Now what's what you have to do is you have to maintain the conductors all the way into the end state. I understand that. So you have to maintain the conductors all the way into the end state. That means you cannot have any wires or any other metals inside your cathode here. Well, we had uh, the airplanes I worked on in the Navy. Or turbo prop engines. And for some reason, what they call the tur turbine inlet temperature is very, very critical. So they had a ring of thermocouples that went around where the turbine, where the where the uh, where the combustion chamber fed the back turbine that turns everything. Right? Y'all know how jet engine works. Uh, the way that we, we do with a jet engine is we have a bunch of impellers in the front, which is compressing. By the way, when you compress something, y'all know when you compress any gas, it automatically heats up. Right? You understand? So if you compress a gas, if you compress a gas enough, it's going to self explode. And that's the way diesels work. So diesels don't have spark plugs in them. So you won't see a, a spark plug in a diesel engine because they depend on extremely high water compression. But what they do with a jet engine is they have a bunch of blades in the front and they keep getting more and more and then this feeds the combustion chamber and then they have a bunch of turbines on the back that basically spin the whole bunch. So what they do is they have some means of getting these big turbines starting to spin uh, this com this uh, basically com uh, 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 gives a lot of pressure inside the inside the uh, combustion chamber. They ignite it one time, and then they're through. So once it's ignited, it does what from then on self ignite because we have so much pressure. Well, this is where our thermal couples were at right here. Because if you if this got too hot, then you could literally melt the blades off this back thing, and that's a bad thing. Right. So they had a ring of good gracious, I don't know, probably 30, 40 thermocouples that went around this ring back here. And then they had a temperature gauge inside the cockpit, which was had a tur turbine in, in the temperature. Back then, uh, we had a lot of analog gauges. Digital gauges, you're not going to still, just in airplanes, you're still going to run into a lot of analog gauges. Uh, for a while, they tried to go to digital photometers. You know, what happened to those things? Well, they realized right off the bat that digital, you have a tendency to look at, to translate it, right? You understand? An analog gauge, uh, so most of us now, on our analog gauge, on our speedometer, even though everything's digital, we still have an analog speedometer because once you're familiar with your car, you basically can tell how fast you're going just from your what? From your peripheral vision. So in airplanes, a lot of the gauges in airplanes are still analog gauges. So they had a TI a turbine in the temperature gauge. And what was so neat is that we would arrange the gauges. You'd go into the airplane and all the gauges would be at weird angles. Because the way we arranged the gauges is everything was, if everything was good, all your gauges pointed straight back. And they looked at the car. 
So all the flight engineer had to do is just do what? Just scan those. If one of those gauges wasn't pointing straight up, they what? They knew, they knew they had a problem. Put his parachute. Yeah, put his parachute. I got a story about that too. <laughs> I'll go ahead and tell you. Well, we were we were flying. We called it flying airways. We were about thirty-two thousand feet, and they drill all the time. They drill all the time. And I, I worked maintenance, so they they would fly us. I wasn't part of the flight crew, but they would fly us with them any place they was going to some place that didn't have maintenance. So we was flying airways, and we was up real high. And I was back on the back. They had a heated floor panel. They kept the plane real cold because of all the electronics. But one of the floor panels under one of the big sensor stations was heated. So we'd go back there. Uh, the plane had two two bunk beds in it, but we left those for the pilots and stuff. We <laughs> So we slept on the floor. So I was back there asleep. I was sound asleep, had my hat down. And all of a sudden the guy come up there and started kicking on my, my foot and said, Rich, put your shoe on. <laughs> and I opened my eyes and everybody was running around getting their parachutes on. And boy, it scared me to death. So I jumped up and went back there and nobody told me it was a drill. So I was, but I guarantee if that, if I had opened that door, Rich would have went out it. <laughs> But I got my straps crossed. I didn't realize, so I would have lost my family jewels if we would have jumped. Because when you put your, you hook your bottom straps up, you're supposed to put them up straight. Well, I got them crossed, so mine was X right across. <laughs> but I would have still went. <laughs> That's the true story. But if they had opened that door, Rich would have probably been the first one out. But we all got lined up, and then the pilot says, well, it took so long to do that, guys. That just ain't going to handle it. My heart was going 90,000 miles an hour. And if we'd have jumped out at 32,000 feet, none of us would have been alive anyway. So, uh, so what had happened was that one of our thermocouples, one of the wires broke off our thermocouples, and guess what we did? We went out there with our soldering gun and we soldered it back together. And so we did it. We do, we broke a wall. A cardinal rule: we put we took we put two more metals into the mix. So, uh, Is that the fact that we the well, no, they had to fly the plane back to Lockheed. We couldn't even we couldn't even we couldn't even work with the thermocouples. We just didn't have the equipment to do it. But when they found out what we did, they got kind of upset. <laughs> so, uh, they had to just uh, go by the face of the, that uh, the the. The engine wasn't going to burn up when they flew it to Lockheed, but that had to do that anyway. I'm not going to tell you some of the other stuff we did that we got in trouble with. Uh, so this is the uh, isometric. This is what most of us uh, use right here. So they use a reference set up by a solid state device, which gives us a reference. And then we use this to come in and actually get our signal. So this is the way most of your uh, most of your uh, sensor sensors work on that. So if you got a thermocouple for your uh, meter yeah. and the wire never breaks, you just basically screw it. If the wire breaks, you screw it. Don't get out there and do what? Solder together because what you just did is just what? Put another junction in there. And now your reference don't mean anything. So this is going to be referenced to a certain, to a certain type of thermocouple. And then these thermocouples use different metals, and like I said, you got to maintain the metals. So here they are right here. Uh, so they're they're given a class depending on the temperature range that they they're they're used to, to, to measure. And what you want to do is none of them go down to zero, but they're very very accurate as far as what they do. It reduces atmosphere, and they don't tell us the metals here. Do they? Uh, so when you buy a thermocouple, you buy it by a type number, and the type number would define the maximum temperature that you can measure. Okay, okay. so this guy's designed to give you extreme accurate measurements for clean water. Yeah. I think this is what they use to measure the temperature of the steel. Well, out of U.S. steel, that's before they tap the the steel, depending on what type of steel it was trying to make, they, they use different temperatures. And right before they tap it, they'd go out there and they had a big old rod, they'd put a thermocouple on there, and they would literally do what? Uh, dip it down in the steel. Into the steel, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so 
And then they would take it out and throw it away. So it was one of those one shotgun. One shot. But the third, the uh, the uh, cue box had a little had a hole in the doors. Uh, it got so hot, by the way, the door, the doors were actually water cooled. So they had a open house out there one day, and they had all these uh, these things. So the people they come up there to those cue box, and they opened up the doors, and they had about four people pass out. <laughs> you you just don't understand heat, guys, until you get in front of melting steel. You just you just don't understand heat. You just don't understand. So I think the next one actually gives us the uh yeah the metals. And then color code. So we have color code for each one of these guys. Because if you got the wrong thermocouple and you put it in there, you got you're gonna have problems, right? And so go get me one of them thermocouples. And you go in there and you got all these different colors and you just grab them. So this is the actual color code for these different thermocouples. Probably the one you, you know, probably the one you have in your oven might be this, but it don't have to be that because normally when you, so your oven has a thermal couple in it. You got an electric oven that's got well, even if you got a gas oven that's got thermal couple. In it. Uh, if you got uh, a lot of uh, refrigerators use thermal couples, right? You understand that? Uh, so this guy right here, he actually goes for a minus. So this guy's designed to minus from two hundred to three hundred fifty degrees. These guys are extremely accurate. They are accurate if you get the right thermal couple on what it's designed to make. Are we okay? So I don't know what type of oven has in it, but it would probably be probably this guy right here, right? Because you never go to zero. What is Constantine? Constantine. Oh, is a, Constantine. That's what they call it. They pronounce it. That's the way I've heard it pronounced. It's just a type of metal. Um, now it works real good with what aluminum, and then it gets a measure of temperature between this range right here. Uh, uh, gas gas water heaters use thermal couples. Now what they do on a gas water heater, gas water heater doesn't hook up to electricity, right? And so how does it open the gas valve and close the gas valve? Well, it's got a thermocouple in there, and the thermocouple is, 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 is actually riding above the pilot light. So it, it's above the pilot light. It's what it's what that that current is actually what's opening the main valve. If the pilot light goes out, what does that do? Well, the main valve will never open, and it won't just squirt air out and gas out into the air, right? It doesn't it work right. So a gas water heater uses a thermocouple. It's going to be mounted uh, up inside your pilot light. Uh, we don't use we don't use thermocouples in uh, air, HVAC systems. Normally, you use the mystery tools to do the next thing. But extremely uh, uh, high temperature measurements, very accurate. These guys here are the route to go. Uh, the only thing we got to do is we got to maintain the metals all the way into the indicator, right? In the similar, they got to be maintained. If you change metals, then what you just do? You inserted another junction, right? In the similar. Yeah, the indicator is what's going to tell you what what the thermal couple is measuring. If I just had a thermal couple, it's going to mean nothing. Right. Unless I get some type of indication of what the thermal couple is measuring. So on my oven, it would go into my temperature control circuit. So I come up here, I set a set point up there, right? And the thermal couple comes into the other side and they match my what? My set point. Uh, US Steel sent it to a gauge. So they would plug it in there, and if it came up and measured the right temperature, then they would say if it measured the range that they were looking for, then it would be okay. If it wasn't the range, then they would either throw more gas to it or take some away and get it within that range before they started adding other, other, other things. Well, they made all types of steel out there in U.S. steel, from soft steel up to extremely hard steel steel. So what they would do is they would add different things like lime to it or carbon to it and stuff like that to get that way up tougher. So I, I, I didn't work over there. I just know. 
what they did usually they it wasn't so big usually they added most of that stuff when it came out so they would pour it in a big old label uh, and then they would move it out and you'd see these guys with these big old bags and they'd just be throwing it over next to it and then they'd run it into something they call a they call it a mixer after it went, went into a mixer they had two mixers out in the cube box I only read two of them. They had three uh, cue box, but they only ran two at a time. And the mixer, of course, would keep the, keep it. It was just another furnace that they circulated and sealed with. And they also kept it melted, melted until they could come up and decide what they'd do. I think it went through the it went through the mixer before it went to the to the continuous caster, right? Yeah, the mixer for so long. Yeah. So this is what we're talking about. So these metals have to be maintained. This is an instrument right here, but the metals have to be maintained up until whatever you're using that instrument for. So you're normally on your oven, it don't show you the temperature you're at, it shows you the temperature that you set. And then when it gets up to that temperature, then the electronics cuts off your, your heating gas, right? Whether it's a gas whether it's a gas oven or whether it's you know. okay. yeah, I've got one of those little yeah. yeah, you got a thermocouple. Normally you can see the junction and you can see where they fuse the two metals together. The first time we used them, we just, uh, when I was in the thesis class, we just wrapped them together. They gave us the two metals and then we wrapped them together. And then uh, we would come up and uh, set up a cold junction. And I, our cold junction, we just submerged it in ice water. And then we would take that other one, and it, it, it was surprising how accurate these things were. But your meter is going to have to be calibrated to a certain type of these because the amount of voltage they put out, of course, would be dependent on five watts. So you might not be able to take a thermal couple that's for my meter and plug it into your meter. It might be a lot. It'd be odds are, it might be a different. Oh, you know, we're plugging in. I'm just just plug it into your regular voltage edge maker. You can plug it in between common. Common it and there it's designed to fit between common and your plugs. And, and it's calibrated for whatever they need. There's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a little bit of green on the meter. How could you know it? Dumb question, I'm sorry. Yeah, I said I never used it. Yeah, so I was I was never used it. I've never used mine either, so I bring mine around. Uh, but uh, what they do on multimeters, to be a multimeter, what do you need to measure? To be called a digital multimeter, what do you need to make? Voltage, amps, ohms. Uh, but it's just like our car. You know, we could have a car that has. A, what do you need to have a car? You got to have wheels. You got to have a steering wheel. You got to have a motor, right? Brake pedals. So, what do we buy cars for? The the features, right? So we buy cars by by the features the cars have, not by what the car does, by what the features it has. And that's the same thing they started to do with multimeters, is they started adding what? Additional features to it, like temperature measurements, uh, frequency measurements, pulse measurements, uh, yeah, capacitor measurements. Unfortunately, I've never seen one that measures inductors. I've seen them that measures capacitance, but I know they got inductive meters out there, but uh, I've never seen an inductive measurement measuring capability on a multimeter. I've seen inductive meters that are specifically designed for measuring the size of inductors, but I've never seen the capabilities on a digital multimeter. And why, I don't know. I guess because if you put DC on them, you get big problems. Okay. All right, so guys, this is where we, we're going. I need to run this off for you, right? I need to find it. Because I need to do what? Give y'all that handout. So let's go ahead and turn on the lights and go to lab. By the way, I brought in uh, a lot more. Uh, so everybody can have their own safety tag. I got rubber bands on them. So everybody, everybody in the group is supposed to be putting all these up, right? So I'm sending them. And you should have your name on it. We don't need to have to put anything else on ours. Jackson, come in.